Um, this is the horizontal top bar hive, and I'm assuming the fact that you're here means that you probably don't know an awful lot about it, so I'm going to start from a very basic end. Um, that is nothing to do with it, that's a skep, it's half made, really just to show you how they are made, um, and it's done with a, a straw rope. This is a cow horn, terribly ethnic sort of um, tools you need, you need a chicken leg and a cow's horn okay, to make these. Chicken, the cow's horn forms the guide for the straw, so you, pu you push the straw through that side and that gives you a gauge for the thickness of the rope. And the chicken leg bone is essentially a needle which you, you can push between the um, straw rope and then you can put the willow um, or, or uh, what's it called? Um, Blackberry, that's the other one. Yeah, bramble. Um, traditionally used, push it through into a hollow of the leg bone and then withdraw it and it makes the whole thing. Um, we'll do a skip day one day or something, maybe at the next conference. But I look, what, the reason I, I don't keep bees in skips, but I do use these for catching swarms. They're great for catching swarms in. Bees seem to love straw, I don't know why, but they do. I think it's maybe because it's got that perfect combination of insulation and um, ventilation. And they just adore it. Getting them out of it is the, is the biggest problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, horizontal top bar hive. This is, I believe, the most versatile, the simplest, most versatile, most bee friendly, and most beekeeper friendly hive. Because, um, let's start with its friendliness to bees. Bees can build comb um, with a reasonable drop. There's a good, there's about a 12 inch drop in there and they can build free natural comb from the top bar, so they're only attached to the top and you get the occasional attachment to the side, but they can easily be cut through with a, a bread knife. Um, it's, uh, if you get the spacing right, and that's, that's really the, probably the biggest art involved in this, this type of way, I think, if you get the spacing right, bees will build nice straight comb on the bars and you won't get a big mess. If they start going off, then you do need to kind of intercept it and manage them a little bit to get it going straight. But once they are going straight, um, you get very, very few problems. They are as easy to inspect as any framed hive, as long as you're gentle and you don't do anything sudden. Um, the art of, of comb management is to be very careful with it. If we pretend that that's a comb for the sake of argument. Um, if you suspend it like that so it finds its own point of balance, it will be fine. If you if you try to do that with it, it will break off and you'll get a big mess, so don't ever do that. You need to train your bee inspector to be gentle, because some of them are quite rough, because they're used to handling frames, you know, they're used to going bang, bang, bang through a hive, and um, you've got to, you can't do that with a top bar hive, you've got to be gentle. So this is why I always suggest this type of hive, particularly um, for beginners, and a lot of a lot of old beekeepers will say you know, <coughs> top bar hives are all right, but you don't you know they're not for beginners. They they take a lot of they're not at all difficult to manage. And I think if you learn to handle comb and bees in one of these hives, it's the best possible training for any other type of hive because you have to be gentle with this hive. You can get away with being rough in a in a national hive or a Davies or a Langstroth. Cannot get away with being up in these. You've got to be slow and gentle. And if you learn slow and gentle from day one, you'll be keeping. That's how you'll always handle bees. The only trouble I ever get with these types of hives is people who converted from from you know conventional hives to top bars, and they think they can treat the, the bees and the comb in the same way, and they can't. They learn that the hard way for the first time. Usually. So typically. Um, setup would be this particular one has got what I call a periscope entrance this has high entrance holes inside the hive and low entrance outside the hive this is an innovation as yet not fully tested uh, the idea being that um, bees in a uh, with a low entrance if bees are coming in at floor level <coughs> there's always the possibility of varroa being kicked out by bees above them falling onto them Yes, and becoming then then become a carrier of varroa. If bees can come in at a, a higher level into the hive, then there's that reduces that possibility to almost to zero because everything above that height is stores anyway. 
okay? So they're coming in above brood level, not below it. But if you have entrance holes at this height going straight through, um, you're going to leak heat. Yeah, the hive atmosphere is going to leak out, especially in winter, and that can be a danger. And the bees will tend to propolize the entrance holes up down to really tiny holes. So the, the, pro the periscope entrance is an is a attempt at, at getting the best of both worlds. Also, I, I'm hoping it's going to help the bees deal with wasps, hornets, and robbers, because I think it's going to confuse all of those who are trying to get into the hive. But as I say, that's only an idea at the moment. How long have you been running it that way? <coughs> I haven't yet. This, oh is, right, this, this, is, this is the first yeah. one I've built. And Very I interesting. As you see, there's no bees in there yet. <laughs> so it's a, new, it's a new idea. Who knows? The other innovation is the floor. Up till now, I've always used mesh floors on the on the advice of you know the, 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 those that those that are wise, um, because obviously it allows varroa mites to drop straight through and become ant food, which is fine. Um, some problems with um, mesh floors. Um, um, no, I don't want to go into that end of it. Let's let's stick with this. The idea of this floor is that it contains um, a little ecosystem, yeah? which in this case is, is wood chips and chopped up bits of tree from up the hill. But it could be any form of sawdust or wood shaving or um, you know um, I don't know cedar wood chips or something like that. The idea is that it still allows um, vapour permeability, it still allows some ventilation, and when mites fall onto it, they get eaten by earwigs, wood lice, and all the other things that I'm encouraging to live in there. So it's, a, it's an attempt to make the horizontal hive more like a hollow log, I should say. It's, 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 it's regarding <coughs> the hive as a complete ecosystem and not just a place where you put bees. Because I don't know how many of you have, have left empty hives lying around or empty boxes of any kind lying around in your garden, but it's very, very uh, um, short amount of time before earwigs and other things start to colonise it. You know. I expect those of you who've even left the door open on your tent for more than an hour will come back and find all kinds of little things crawling around inside it. You know. um, so the idea is that if bees are happy in hollow logs, which contain all kinds of little bugs and creepy crawlers, then why not give them um, a hollow log that's got bugs and creepy crawlers in it and just see what happens. I have an idea that earwigs do eat varroa mites if they get half a chance, because varroa, um, earwigs are um, pretty omnivorous creatures, they'll eat anything that they come across. They just seem to live quite happily with bees. I've opened top bar hives and had a, like a thousand earwigs scurry off the yeah, top of exactly the yeah. yeah. And the dead bees fills because the donsets triggers of the cleaning uh, desire to get the dead bodies out. If the dead bees stay there, what's happened then? Um, dead bees are going to fall to the bottom and presumably get eaten by. So they don't trigger bees. off a reflex. I have to get it out for the other bees. They might, or they might go, well, Difficult it's okay, because it's okay. being eaten by something else, I'm not going to bother taking it away. Okay. I don't know. It, uh, okay. This is all very experimental, so who knows? I mean, I... There's no reason why the dead bees shouldn't sit on the top, really. Yeah, it might just it. sit on the top and another bee might come Wouldn't up. Wouldn't they be so eaten up by those little insects uh, and disappear? The dead bees will be eaten up by the insects? Here we eat them. Yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah. yeah. So they'll be cleaned up, you know, na nature uh, has a way of recycling everything. And, uh, um, I honestly don't know, but if they do, then the bees will, I imagine, see to it that they don't get too close to the honey. Um, I've never found earwigs on honey, I have to say, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible. Um, I don't know whether they've, they've got a sweet tooth. Um, so, what else is in here? Um, Typically, okay, yes, my, my swarm catching process, the way I catch bees and get them into a top bar hive is as follows. I would have a, a skep that's a bit bigger than this, obviously, be about this high. The neck of it is, is the right size for these top bars, which are the same as national frames, by the way, and that's not an accident. Um, I catch the swarm in the basket, in the skep, and I put top bars over it like this. There's a film of me doing this on the website, by the way close up the gap with top bars, they have an entrance hole over here, the bees fan like crazy, get all their mates in, and then when they're all inside, put a cork or a bit of grass in the entrance, put a bungee cord around the whole thing, put it in the car, take it away to wherever 
that the hive is going to be that these guys are going to live in. Okay, leave them in this for about a week, and come back and find that they have built a nice set of combs in the middle. And I get a couple of top bars, and I go either side like this, lift the whole colony out as it's hanging from the top bars, and then place it exactly like that directly into the top bar hive. Um, Usually I can do it without any mishaps. Um, drop it directly into the top bar like hive like that. The bees have hardly noticed anything's changed. All they've done is switch from, a, from being in a straw thing into a wood thing. Because they've already built comb, because the queen's already laying, uh, they're not going to have scorned that's home as far as they're concerned. They haven't changed the geographical position because the hive was, you know, the skep is exactly where the hive is going to be. And um, this is a very easy way of getting bees into a top bar hive, only disturbing them once at the point where you actually catch them. After that, it's simply just a simple lift in. But the combs have to have the same size uh, in the in the scap than the in the top bar. You must you leave it in for too long. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. If you leave it in for up to a week, yeah. then they'll have built comb like oh, this. No. If you leave it two weeks, they they could be building, touching yeah. the side. And like yeah. attaching, and to the attaching it to the side. Yeah. Yeah. Then you've got a problem because, yeah. you know, you can, yeah. the whole thing can jam. Yeah. That did happen to me. I left them for a whole winter in a basket once, yeah. and I literally couldn't get yeah. them out without breaking yeah. comb. Yeah. When you so take a cardboard carton, because some people collect this with an easy carton, with a box of paper. Yes. You know, so you can fold it yes. flat in the car, if you yeah. see something, you bring it up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I always carry one of these around the back of the car ah, yeah. in, in the spring. So, when yes. you say you leave it for a week, yeah. is that with the um, one in no, the Oh, no, no, it's a good one. They need to fly. Well, don't say it becomes part of the um, this is a very versatile hive, it's very beekeeper friendly because there are no extra boxes, there's nothing to lift. Uh, as long as you make your roof, I mean that's a flat roof, I generally use gabled roofs because I, don't, I can put a condenser box in there in the winter like a warrior. But, um, or you can put sheep's wool or anything else in there as insulation if you choose to. Um, it's uh, very easy to build, there's no critical dimensions. As long as you build um, all your hives the same, from the same pattern, then the comb will be interchangeable between them. Um, you don't have to worry about bee space, the bees deal with bee space. The only, the only experimental bit really for, for some people is the width of the top bar, but as long as you keep, I tend to use 34 by 22 wood from B&Q because you can buy it cheaply and that works perfectly well. I, I may start experimenting with narrower bars and shims. Did like I talk about this in this session or not? Shims? Okay. Um, this is something that some people use. They use a narrower bar and they put a shim in it to take it out to the full width. And then when they get to the honey area of the hive, um, they, they use a thicker shim of honey area because bees like to make fatter comb in the honey part of the hive. So you simply use a thicker wooden shim um, in that area. Or you start without a shim at all in the brood area and then add the shims for the honey area. There's all sorts of ways of doing it. That's probably where I went wrong, so I've got 32 million of these bars. Yeah. They do five, five, six, five, six, yeah. and then once they got to eight, nine, ten, right. ten. Right. I've got to say it's down to 31 mil bar. Yeah. You've got 31? Yeah. yeah. Right yeah. through. It makes it quite tidy because you don't get that fat bit of honey at the top mm -hmm. you get with the wider bar sometimes. So. Yeah. 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 So, um, because I've done this three times, I've forgotten what I've said yeah. to each group, <laughs> so I, I kind of got, got a bit confused. Any, let, let's go for questions. Any, any more questions? Have about the queen. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't use these. This is this is. I simply put this in to show that if you want to use a queen excluder in a top bar hive, so you want just comb with nothing but honey in it, you can just make a vertical top. Uh, queen. If there's any discouraging, it wouldn't stop because there's a gap at the bottom. The queen is unlikely to, to crawl down say, and leave them back on the other side, to be honest. Queens don't like crossing empty space or uninhabited areas. They like to stay you know, in the dark in, with, their, with their friends. So, um, so it doesn't matter how you gap at the bottom, does it? I don't think it does really, no. I don't, I don't, I don't fuss too much about the gap at the bottom. If I'm, oh, something I meant to mention, on this side of the hive there are five entrance holes simply to show you that you can run five nukes side by side in a single box if you want to. So you can do splits within the same box.
this is something I've, I've been doing quite a lot recently because I've got a couple of colonies that I wanted to propagate. Um, simply, adding, simply putting um, colour boards in between each section, you can actually do splits horizontally within one hive. And the bees, well, because they're used to using these entrance holes anyway, will just randomly fly in and keep all of them fed. Yeah, they'll just fly in whatever entrance hole is, is happens to be open. And so no new will be that, that gap at the bottom allows them to pass between the chambers? Uh, it would if it was that big, yes, to be honest. And, and I think if I was running nukes side by side, I would probably have a better seal. Yeah. I probably, yeah, probably would want to keep them separate. So, I mean, mm. I've got one of these, I wasn't vigilant at the beginning, mm. the, the, the area the inspector gave up had foul proof in, it's because it's, you know, it's a bee haven in there, with home everywhere. But I notice what's happening now, I also haven't been vigilant in keeping the sides free of wax, because, uh, or, or propolis, because, um, if you have gaps, yes. you can get um, wax moth in there, they sit in yes. there. Well, yeah, they'll lay their eggs yeah. in there, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The but that's a good point about problems. Um, another reason for using um, timber from B&Q is you can go in there and you can choose the straight ones. Yeah. <laughs> if you get wonky top bars, that one is actually slightly wonky, yeah. um, it will create gaps, and uh, as Penny rightly says, um, gaps get populated by wax moth if you're not careful. And that's one of the reasons that these hives generally are much less prone to wax moth than conventional hives because there's nowhere for the wax moth to hide. Every space in there is accessible to bees, whereas on conventional frames, particularly the bottom bars, where the foundation goes into the bottom bars, it's a nice little, little gap in there, but it's just a perfect spot for wax moth to lay their eggs. Um, and they love it, and the bees can't get in there to dig them out. So. But in a top bar hive, because you don't have any of that, there's nowhere for wax moth to hide. And I've never had a wax moth fall me. I've had wax moth try to get in, and, you know, but bees can deal with it because they can access every part of the hive. So, I, I know you, like, we usually need to call warrants. I was, I was how you find using these before I'd even heard of warrants. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering how you. Mm. I've, I've, I've got a couple of warriors. I've got one, to be honest, no, I've got one warrior running at the moment. Personally, I haven't had a lot of success with warriors. And I'm not saying that that's something that's wrong with warriors. It's to do with the way I have been operating, I'm sure. But I, I have not had a lot of success with warriors in boxes yet. But I, I'm not going to give up on them. I'm, I'm going to persist. And I, you know, I hope to make them work one day. The, the problem I have is getting the bees to build more than one or two boxes they seem to go they seem to build a couple of boxes and just give up and swarm or or just you know, have one swarm themselves completely out and have yeah. this through swarm after swarm so there are no bees left. And the only way I found them to well not the only way but I've got one colony that's in one box. It's been in that one box since uh, early last year and they seem quite happy in that one box and they will not move out of it. So I thought, well, come on, we've got to get these guys moving. So what I did was take out all the bars from the box underneath and now they're building long, nice long comb. But of course they're now building comb from one set of top bars but two boxes deep. So I've no idea what I'm going to do with them, <laughs> except leave them alone probably. Um, so did you have your one box mixing in another box? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what's about. It may be because it, the wood's new. Maybe that it be, I have an idea that bees aren't keen on new wood. Actually. I think that, that might be part of the problem. I think they need to have enough bee numbers to actually make that jump and jump down that's into right. a new box. You know, yeah, they need a, they that's do. why he says a two kilo swarm really is ideal. Yes, big, I think starting bees. with a big swarm yeah, is probably part of it. And that wasn't a big swarm I started with, so yeah. it may be part of the problem. I think it's also just a weakness that even Worry admitted himself, he says, it's a weakness having these bars yeah, breaking up the food nest. And right. they seem to have to build up a pressure before they can jump that, sure. that oh. floor in there. Sure. And I mean, ideally, you would work two boxes. Mm. Yeah, well, I said oh, yeah. the double depth box is ideal, 410 yeah. or sure. 20. But then yeah. you've got a weight problem. 
Yeah. 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 And you can't yeah. harvest honey very easily because it's in an enormous spot, so there's always food. Yeah. Well, because in the deer as well, you're feeding. feeding. Yeah. Presumably, you, you don't take too much honey off, so they've got enough to last through the winter anyway. I always aim to leave honey, in, plenty of honey for them through the winter, so I always make an estimation in early September. Have they got enough stores for winter? We're lucky in our area, we've got a lot of Himalayan balsam on the rural banks, and they love it, and it, it's a nice honey to end the season with. Uh, and of course, then there's the ivy after that, but that tends to set off concrete. So, but the, the, the balsam provides a nice for buffer at the end of the season. Um, but once I've gone and had a quick look at them, and I, I know there's a good six or seven bars of solid stores in there, I just close them up and let them, let them go for the winter. And if there's honey left in the spring, I'll take that for my own use as long as I'm confident that they're happy and that there's more stuff coming in. Yeah. And do you find the cluster does manage to migrate Oh yes, yeah. absolutely. <coughs> Yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's a whole myth about bees not wanting to work horizontally. It just isn't true. They'll, they'll work in any direction that, that, you know, that looks convenient. They're very adaptable. They don't get stuck in the winter at one end and can't migrate to the stores. Um, only, the only way that might happen is if you start off, um, I have got some hives that I, that I still use like this, I have a colony in the middle of the hive, the central entrance, and then if you expand it in both directions, Mm. they will tend to have a brood area in the middle and then stores each side. Mm -hmm. So if you've got that arrangement, it's best to come along before the winter and get one lot of stores and put them all up the other end. Right. So that this, the brood is in one place yeah, and the right stores right. are all in one direction mm -hmm. from the brood. Mm -hmm. That way they can just chomp their way steadily through it. Mm -hmm. But actually I found, I don't know why, whether this is just me or, or whether it's a, you know, something particular at Top Five, they seem to eat less in this, in, in top of hives than, than, than they do in, in nationals. I don't know why it is. Maybe the insulation's better mm -hmm. and they just don't feel the need to generate so much heat. Mm. Um, maybe the idea of 35 pounds of honey for their winter stores is based on Italian bees, which are notoriously hungry. Mm -hmm. yeah? Italian bees eat like crazy all the time, it seems to me. Um, <laughs> even a couple of summers ago when we had, we had a couple of summers that went bad on us um, early July and it rained right through the rest of July and right into August. The Italian bees that had plenty of stores at the beginning of that period were virtually starving by the end of it, whereas the more kind of mongrelized bees weren't at all, didn't seem at all bothered, they still had plenty of stores left. So I think maybe those numbers, that 35 pound uh, myth that has been carried on through the beekeeping world is actually based on it became the, stuff, the norm mm. at the time when Italian bees were being imported to the country in large quantities. And I think Italian bees definitely eat a lot, a lot of food, but a lot of mongolized bees are I found when I made mine that you put a strip across to stop the bars sliding sideways. Yep. That help? Is there any disadvantage to that? Yeah, we can collect in there. <coughs> only if you get it. I, I use that in some of mine, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's a good idea as long as you leave enough room so you can get your fingers there to lift the bars. You can also make a hinge lid, lid and that, that can work very well. Again, as long as you... Somebody, a friend of mine, built a, a lovely hinge lid high, but he put the support for the hinges right up against the bars. So now so he's, now he's had to put a row of screws with a head sticking up along the ascent so he can pick the bar up. So if you're just aware of those little things, you can, you can do it any way you like. Sure, yeah. Well, there's certain, partly there's a natural exchange because you're removing all cones with the honey. And of course, it's the new ones that they're going to put me into. So, yes, that's a good question. And I do tend to keep old cone near up to one end. Okay, so for example, if, if this was um, a two-year-old cone and it's starting to get a bit mm. black and a bit nasty, keep it towards one end, mm -hmm. and then if you want to isolate it further, put an empty top bar in the gap, mm -hmm. and then they'll start building comb on this, and they'll gradually abandon. If you have enough gap, they'll start to abandon this, and then you can take it out and get rid of it. I've, I've for five years now made top bars, but I have some confidence. Mm -hmm. 
I can't manage to get them out because you know it's uh, almost good on there and it's really dark now. So just maybe just I keep them right up right at one end and put some extra empty top bars yeah. in because the queen doesn't like to cross empty space. Yeah. So yeah. You know, as long as she's you know, make sure the queen isn't on the old yeah. toe, yeah. um, they will gradually abandon it. Sorry, did I miss what was that? Um, this. This is um, something I, sh I shouldn't even have brought this because mm. mm. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is. Well, everybody knows this is a queen excluder. Okay, I don't use them. I made it simply to prove the point that if you want to use a queen excluder in a horizontal hive, you can simply by cutting up a piece of excluder and mounting it vertically. So you can, if you want to, um, get comb that's pure honey and got no brood on it at all. But I don't use it. Yeah. I've got a lot of similar things to show that I don't use either. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to inspect, um, you have to take the whole roof off. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and does that let them let all the heat out? No. The colony is always enclosed between two follower boards. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Two heavy follower boards. And the... So this, uh, this, this becomes a, a, a sealed chamber, if you like. Sorry, I should have said that first off, yeah. and thank you for bringing it up. Um, to perform a quick check, it's a very easy matter to move one follower board away, have a look, look, look in there, oh yeah, they're building cone, they're doing exactly what they should be doing, go the other end, move that away, yeah, that's great, no problem, there you go. Ten second inspection, um, and along with information you get from looking at the entrance, then often that's all you need. Yeah. Do, do you always keep the hive full of top bars with no gaps to stop uh, rubbing and that? Or? The part where the, the, bru where the bees are, Obviously, it's always closed up. Yeah. Do you mean elsewhere? The empty part of it as well? No, no, I don't. No. Just make sure that the, the followers are reasonably good fit. Reasonably tight. With so this yeah. kind of um, experimental floor, um, there is always the possibility of wasps getting up over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I always keep mine there. quite closed up with shims yeah. and stuff to sort of stop anything. That's a good idea. Yeah. And what I might do with this type of floor is just take a handful of this stuff and just pull up the whole. Lock it up a bit. Yeah. Because like is this is this a sort of more advanced prototype from the one that's on the website? Yeah. <laughs>